I, I need to go home. I don't belong here. We're going to send you home as soon as you're well. I'm fine. But you're not fine. People who are fine don't write on walls. Then get me a typewriter. You're not listening. The stories have got to stop, Benny. They are too dangerous. But too dangerous to whom? To you. This world you've created, this Deep Space Nine, Captain Sisko and Kira and the others, none of it is real. All it is to me. Hey, Star Trek book fans, Dan Gunther here with another edition of the Treklet Report, where I review a new release from the Star Trek Pocket Books novel line. The book I'm talking about this week is from last year, Star Trek Deep Space Nine Gamma Original Sin by David R. George III. Quick reminder of the format, the first half of this video will be generally spoiler free, I'll talk about some of the initial incidents in the novel, but I'll be keeping the real spoilers for the last half of the video, and I'll give you a warning when I'm going to do that. Original Sin features two different stories that run in tandem in the novel. The first one takes place in the year 2380, during that period of time where the Deep Space Nine novels skipped ahead. For those of you that don't know, the Deep Space Nine post-finale continuity was kind of running along, and then David Mack did the Destiny trilogy, and it was decreed that the continuity would jump ahead. We therefore got a number of skipped years, during which Esri Dax became captain of the USS Aventine, Kira Norris became a Vedic in the Bajoran religion, among a number of other changes as well. During this period, there was a kidnapping of Rebecca Sisko, who is Benjamin Sisko and Cassidy Yates' daughter, the, uh, the child that she was pregnant with in the final episodes of the Deep Space Nine television series. The second story is set six years after that in 2386 aboard the USS Robinson. Captain Benjamin Sisko is her commanding officer and is currently on an extended mission of exploration into the Gamma Quadrant. During that mission, a number of children from the Robinson are abducted by an enigmatic race of half alien, half machine sort of aliens called the Glant and the book documents Cisco and Cruz attempts to rescue the children. Both of these stories are very compelling and David R. George III does a really excellent job of linking the two of them thematically and helping us the readers learn a little bit more about both what happened in those six years in between that we skipped over as well as learning a lot about Rebecca, Cisco's daughter, this is a character who has gotten a little bit of screen time, I guess you could say, in a few other books, but whose character has never been really deeply explored. So I really appreciated the chance to get to know her and find out a little bit about what makes her who she is and what it means being the daughter of a half-prophet. So all in all, I was pretty happy with this novel. I'd probably give it a good four out of five stars. Really interesting story. I'm glad to get back to Sisko and his story. As much as I'd like to see him kind of reunited with the rest of the Deep Space Nine crew back on the station, it's still good to get a story centered around him and his family life with Cassidy Yates and his daughter Rebecca. Also, the USS Robinson and her crew, I'd like to get to know them a lot more and hopefully, you know, maybe one day the Pocket Books CBS thing will get resolved and we'll get more novels. And hopefully going forward we might get a Deep Space Nine Gamma miniseries. That kind of seems to be the intention here with that little subtitle here. That almost that this was a planned series going forward. Now obviously these contract negotiations have kind of thrown, in a, thrown a wrench in the works of getting any new Star Trek novels recently. But uh, I know some people might think I'm foolish, but I'm remaining optimistic that this will all get resolved at some point, and uh, we'll, get, we'll get our novels back, guys. Please. It has to happen. Okay, so this is the point where I'm going to be getting into a little bit more of a spoilery territory, talking about the actual plot of the book. So consider yourself warned if you want to keep watching, if you haven't read the book. Uh, I can't be held responsible for any spoilage that may happen. So something that I've always appreciated about Star Trek, and especially the Star Trek novel line, is it kind of refuses to be pigeonholed. Star Trek really is just a setting in which many different kinds of stories can be told. It's not, you know, a, a set 
set of parameters as much as many people might seem to think it is. And especially when you get into the novels, you can have all sorts of stories just set in this universe. And I would say that the first of these two stories that we alternate between in this novel is a really good example of a crime drama set in the Star Trek universe, sort of maybe a CSI Bajor type of story. So it turns out in this story that Rebecca Sisko was kidnapped by a member of the Ohalavaru, who is a follower of Ohalu, a person who wrote uh, prophecies years earlier, thousands of years earlier, but prophecies that kind of maintain that the prophets are not deities, but more um, non-religious and non-spiritual in nature, kind of following the idea that they are wormhole aliens, like members of the Federation would say during Deep Space Nine television series. However, as you read the story, it becomes apparent that his following of Ohalu is just kind of the excuse he uses. This is a very disturbed sociopathic individual and one of the disturbing and interesting things about this story is you really get inside his head and learn his motivations. At times you know it was kind of disturbing following his thought processes as he kidnaps a very young girl uh, for purposes that he believes are righteous and justified but of course they're just twisted imaginings of his own creation and no good will obviously come of this. He's basically a pretty sick and twisted individual and getting into his thought processes while disturbing was actually really interesting and seeing how he reacts to normal everyday occurrences in a way that would never occur to someone who is a lot more socialized and uh, accepting of societal, societal norms and uh, doesn't have the issues that this fellow has. For example, at one point he attracts the attentions of another follower of Ahalavaru, a woman who finds him very attractive and keeps trying to insinuate herself into his life. And his reactions to her are disturbing, but at the same time kind of amusing. Over the course of the story, you follow this individual and his plan and, and what he's doing with Rebecca, taking her across, you know, Bejor's countryside, trying to elude capture. Towards the end of that story, the resolution is a little confusing at first. It seems that Rebecca has some sort of ability that you kind of get a taste of in this story. Basically, Everything comes to a head. The guy sets off a bomb and explodes, killing both him and Rebecca. And you even see this from the perspective of the investigators who are chasing him on a computer monitor. Uh, you see the explosion happen and you know that at that moment they have died. However, the events seem to repeat themselves to the point where I actually read this as an ebook and I thought maybe there was some sort of glitch because, you know, that is not uh, something that is totally unknown. This has happened before where pages repeat or there's some sort of mess up in the formatting of an, of an ebook, but that does not turn out to be the case. In fact, Rebecca has some sort of ability and it everything repeats itself, but because of the uh, huge release of energy that Rebecca gives off when she does this, it clues the investigators in and they're able to rescue her before the bomb explodes and kills them. So uh, it's really interesting that she's able to change her destiny basically and uh, save herself. Of course, she's very young at this point and doesn't really know what's going on. I believe she's three years old, she's a, a toddler. And so she doesn't, she's not even really conscious that she's doing this. She just, uh, it's an innate ability that she seems to have. We go, of course, six years later into this other story in which the Glant have kidnapped these uh, 80-some children from the USS Robinson. And this story is also really interesting. I like the idea that Star Trek is always about kind of trying to find common ground between us and aliens who are very different from us and, and trying to meet in that middle ground and, and find commonalities. This, however, is 
a race of beings that are so alien and their viewpoint is so divorced from anything that we would consider normal that any kind of uh, understanding between the two of them seems to be impossible. And it's, it's really tragic, actually, and you can see that there's failings both on the side of the crew of the Robinson under Cisco and on the side of the Gallant. Both of them have very different viewpoints and very different ways of viewing the universe and will never really be able to understand one another. And I kind of almost link that back to Rebecca's kidnapper in the first story in which, you know, his viewpoint is so twisted that, you know, a regular person can't really seem to understand it. So a little bit of parallel there that I found kind of interesting. Towards the end of this story, Rebecca and the 80-some children are being kind of removed from their bodies. Their consciousness is being transferred out of their body into mechanical uh, beings, sort of robotic life forms. And, you know, this is kind of the nature of the gland. This is what they do. And they, they feel that they're right and justified in doing this. And the scene, the climax, is almost like sort of a body horror type situation where Rebecca finds herself outside of her body, you know, and in this new alien machine body and looking at her former body. And it's really disturbing. But once again she is able to kind of reset time and flash back to a point before this happened, giving uh, Benjamin Sisko and the crew enough time to locate and rescue them. And this time we get a much more clear view of exactly what she did. And in the uh, Literary Treks podcast where Bruce and I, Bruce Gibson and I got a chance to talk to the author, David R. George III, I kind of likened this to uh, a video game save point, uh, you know, where you, you save your video game at a certain point before you attempt a difficult mission, and then if you fail, you can snap back to that point. It's almost as though Rebecca is snapping back to the last point where she was safe, where she was unharmed, and is able to repeat that period of time, and hopefully things change and turn out differently this time around. So. Uh, really interesting that she seems to have this ability and, and of course she's much older at this point and she's more aware of what she can do and her abilities but of course Cisco and Cassidy and the rest of the crew have no idea and don't know that she can do this so it's, it's really interesting I'm really curious to see where this idea goes forward hopefully again we get more novels uh, set aboard the Robinson featuring Cisco and his family so we can kind of learn more about Rebecca and her abilities here. So once again like I said I really enjoyed this novel I'd have to give it a good four out of five stars. Uh, really excited to get some progression on this story and moving forward in the Deep Space Nine universe even though all the characters aren't together and it's not the Deep Space Nine we knew and loved it's uh, moving the story forward and I know a lot of people are disappointed that things are so different now in the Deep Space Nine universe, but I'm really glad to be getting these stories and I'm really fascinated to see where it goes from here. So here's hoping that we get that resolution, we get some, you know, movement on these uh, negotiations, I guess, between CBS and Pocket Books and get a contract signed. I know there's a lot of factors at the moment. A lot of people think it might have something to do with the, uh, the, the court proceedings between Viacom and CBS and this whole merger uh, ordeal. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, you know, get the lawyers talking, that's fine. I want my Star Trek books, basically, is what it comes down to. As I mentioned, Bruce Gibson and I spoke with the author, David R. George III, on the Literary Treks podcast. Here's a brief excerpt from that show. Part of dealing with the Federation is uh, exploring its occasionally imperialist behavior. Um, you know, it's okay to want democracy and and peace and and all of the things that the Federation aspires to, but you can't really impose that on other people. I mean, the glance had what we would consider a, a completely, uh, I don't know, antisocial uh, uh, society or, or um, I mean, it's just such an alien perspective. And yet they were all happy. 
you know, they were they were going along, and you know they you can't you couldn't impose your your way of life on them and make it work. The only way to to try and find a meeting of the minds is to find a meeting of the minds, and you know after what Cisco and his crew went through, it just seemed like sticking around to talk. This is not the time for that. After what we've just been through, after what they've just been through, uh, they, there's, they have, we can't trust them. We know that. And they clearly can't trust us either after all the things that we've done. So, you know what, it's time to move on. But in my head, the Federation will one day come back and try and make overtures again. Maybe successfully, maybe not. It's such an alien perspective. So look for that episode of Literary Treks. You can find it on most uh, podcatchers, iTunes, of course. And uh, there's a YouTube channel for Trek FM. I'll link to the video for that episode of the podcast as well. And you can listen to it there. Uh, have you had a chance to read Original Sin? Let me know in the comments if this book sounds interesting to you, or if you've read it, please share your thoughts, uh, both here and on my Facebook. Uh, I have a Facebook page at facebook.com slash Productions, or feel free to tweet at me at twitter.com slash Kurtrats, and that's just K-E-R-T-R-A-T-S, and I look forward to hearing from you, and of course in the comments below. Thanks especially to the Patreon supporters over on Patreon. I really appreciate the help you're giving me in making these videos. And thanks for just watching, liking, sharing, and subscribing. All of that really helps. But even if you don't do any of that, just watching. I really appreciate that. So thank you so much. Until next time, as always, live long and prosper.